Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves, he's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody else, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face, they basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow this head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reach my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Merkel. Thanks for being here. If you have a crazy, wild experience you want to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is contact at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's contact at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me, just get a hold of me. If you want more shows on a weekly basis, we got you covered. All you got to do is go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, become a member to the website, and then you will get access to the app as well. But also, we are now opening up memberships on YouTube. Same content in both locations, but we are opening up memberships on YouTube for the YouTube audience who do not like just listening, but they like watching as well. So now that is an option for YouTubers as well. Same content, just two different locations. Also, friends, go ahead and check out MerkelFilms.com. That's where we host all our documentaries and movies. Exhibition Dogman and The Shape of Shadows are available right there. And soon we're releasing our new documentary, Sasquatch and the Missing Man. We went out to do a Bigfoot film in Washington State where we featured Wes Germer and his encounter location. And we stumbled across a missing person case that's all intertwined into this new documentary coming out here very soon, probably sooner than you realize. All right, today we have Mike Cullen coming on the show, and Mike studies owls and their connection to UFO encounters, UFO encounters and their connection to owls. Mike believes that when people are saying they saw a five-foot owl after a paranormal encounter, usually that's a scream memory in place of something that was more terrifying than the owl itself. So let's get to Mike and this conversation about the connection between owls and UFO encounters and possible abductions right now. All right. Today we have Mike Cleland on the show. Sir, how are you? I'm very good. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Um, I, I I was telling you earlier, I had stumbled across your work on, uh, on YouTube. And often when I'm driving back and forth from the office, uh, I'm listening to something and usually it's off the same YouTube channels. It's, you know, it's just the feed is curated, uh, or curated. And, um, so when, you popped up. It was with a a channel that I remember I had never seen before, and I clicked on it. And I don't know what caused me to click on it, but I was just absolutely fascinated that there was somebody out there, and I had never known of your work before. But there was somebody out there that that specifically looked into owls. It wasn't like, oh yeah, let me tell you about owls, and then let me tell you about you know Bigfoot. It was just like. Let me tell you about the owls and how everything stems from there. And it was such a fascinating uh, thing to to hear. I was like, man, I got to have this guy on. And my next thought was, well, what if you you can't hold a conversation with him because you don't know anything about owls? I'm like, who cares? Like, just have a conversation and see where it goes. Uh, 
because you know I, I was telling you earlier we had uh, we've had several people on the show throughout the years who are relaying paranormal encounters. Uh, some of it is more generically paranormal to uh, alien ET abduction type stuff, and uh, owls pop up every once in a while, and sometimes they're. These owls are, and I, I don't know, I mean, maybe this is a good question to ask you, even though it's not the direction I necessarily was thinking of taking it. Um, sometimes, and I've known it, I know it's more than once, I've heard people talk about owls that shouldn't exist as far as size goes. Mm-hmm. Very common. This? Oh, very, oh, yeah, very common. <laughs> Yeah, old hat, huh? Well, yeah, I've got to be careful not. To, I sound really callous and cavalier, no, but like fine. once you hear that story five hundred times, you kind of get the point. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, so let, let's just go there because I don't want to bring that up and then not get back to it because I know there's probably a few people who have had that experience. Um, do, is there anything that you recognize with that that stands out as far as why that would be? I mean, because to me it seems like when you're talking about not just an owl appearing, but something that we don't have on record as far as size, we're talking like three, four, five feet tall. Um, do you think that that owl then is a, an actual owl or a, a an image that is being projected or something more paranormal? How do you view that stuff? Okay, so so I'm, I'm in a funny position where I have a very difficult time saying anything with authority, right? Like sure. I cannot say I know something. I can say pe- this is what people report. Oh, I, I feel fine saying that, but I, what the source might be is anyone's guess. And, and I'm, and I will do my very best if I'm speculating about something, you'll be, it'll be really clear I'm speculating about something. If I know something, boy, I'll let you know too. So, okay. um, so we're starting right with the, the, the four foot tall owls. Yeah, why not? Right? Yeah, so, let's do that. so I get four foot tall owl accounts all the time. So, okay, then we're going to just go right into the deep dive. In the UFO lore, there is something called a screen memory. It's pretty well understood by through the researchers who are specifically doing abduct- abduction research or direct contact research. People who feel they've been contacted or taken or abducted by the ufo occupants now we're already on thin ice talking about this kind of stuff so let's walk further out into the thinner ice here's a common very common story someone's driving down the road at night they turn a corner and there's a four foot tall owl in the road or on the side of the road and oftentimes it is dead center in the road and they have to stop and the owl is tall enough to look over the hood of their car very commonly reported. And I'll tell you what, you take the smallest car in the whole world and the biggest owl in the whole world, and that owl cannot look over the hood of the car. So people are driving their big Ford F-150s and this owl is looking at them in the eyes from the road, standing in the headlights right up against the owl. Uh, the impli- So then afterwards, let's say, now I'm going to generalize and kind of morph a lot of stories into into one kind of apocryphal story and someone's driving down the road they see a four foot tall owl often a white owl or a gray owl and then they'll say huh that's really odd i saw this owl and then they'll get home and they'll arrive home and they'll say i was supposed to be home at midnight and it's two in the morning golly i wonder what happened and then perhaps they'll have a handful of other odd life experiences and they'll they'll confront a researcher and the researcher will say let's go back to that night you saw the owl on the road and the hypnotherapist will say okay just you know put put in put the person under hypnosis and then they'll ask describe that owl and they'll say well the owl is about four foot tall it's skinny it's bald it's got big black eyes it's wearing a tight fitting little shiny spacesuit and Mm. i don't think that was an owl so what they will describe under hypnosis is a gray alien, the, the prototypical gray alien that's on like every snowboard bumper sticker. So um, the so the implication is that if you turned that corner and saw a, a creepy, skinny gray alien, like a being from beyond our normal comprehension, you would be pretty freaked out. But you're instead seeing an owl. And the implication is that the owl is, or excuse me, that the, that the gray alien has, whether it's technology or it's a psychic ability, can somehow put into the mind of the observer. They have the 
that power to put in something into the mind of the observer. Now, let me step back a bit. It's not just owls. It's deer. It's raccoons. A lot of squirrels. A lot of, I guess, four foot tall squirrels. I turn the corner and there's a four foot tall squirrel. Or like, I'm like, like I woke up in the middle of the night and there was a four foot tall squirrel at the side of my bed. This is, gets very murky and very bizarre and very easy to dismiss as madness. But once you see the consistency in the pattern of the reports, you got to be, you got to just trust the, the reporting, trust the, trust what people are saying. It could be like you're, you're trusting a hallucination, right? So someone says, I had this, this impression that there was an owl in the road or an owl in the bedroom or an owl on the back porch or an owl looking in the window. But you, things get, things get very murky very quick when you try to ha- take, give, give a hard and fast answer. Here, I'll tell you one quick story. A woman I know very well uh, was working at a girls' school for kids. And this was a camping and outdoor school. So, it was, so she was taking the kids' wilderness camping. And this was in the um, Pacific Northwest. And so she was out in the woods. And she was... The, the one camp, there was a set of girls and there was one campsite here and one campsite there. This is just the available campsites. And there was a path between them and you had to walk a little ways. And so she left one campsite and was walking to the other one full daylight. Now this woman had, was well aware that she had been having contact experiences at the time she was 19 years old. She's around 50 now. And, but at that time in her life, she knew she was having contact experiences. Like she's like, they were abduction experiences. These were not nice experiences for her. And, but they always happened at night. Now she's full daylight, bright sunshine. She's walking down this path. She's all alone. She can hear the girls behind her laughing in the woods. She turns a corner. There's a gray alien standing on the side of the path. Like bright sunshine, chalky white, creepy skin, bald head, big black eyes, skinny, 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 standing right on the side of the path. Now, I'm not sure how up to speed your listeners are, but pretty much all communication with these beings, whether they're gray aliens or, or these angelic Nordics that look like supermodels, is telepathic. There's mm-hmm. Nobody moves their lips when, when they're talking to these beings. It's just straight mind-to-mind communication. So she turns the corner, sees this gray being on the side of the trail, and she's got this immediate psychic reverberation <clears throat> in her mind, and she hears this kind of message like this kind of freaked out panic message going owl, 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 owl. You know, she's hearing it, it's hearing her. <clears throat> and, and she watches this, this gray alien whoosh, morph into an owl. And it turns around and walks into the woods. She actually, this is very interesting. To tell the story completely, she said it like traveled like a little hovercraft, which is also very commonly reported. Oftentimes people don't describe the gray beings walking like this, they just kind of hovercraft along. They like float a few inches off the ground. And which is very dreamlike. And I recognize that. And that makes us all the much more mysterious. So she saw this, this owl, which had seconds ago been a gray alien, just go into the woods. And she went and followed the trail, the path that it would have taken afterwards. And there was a big ditch that you couldn't see. It was in the tall grass. But if it had walked, it would have had to walk, go down the ditch and go up the other side. But that's not what she saw. She saw this thing go right into the, into the woods. So here we have an example of, of a, of a, of an event that messed up. I have the same type of reporting where someone saw a, a, like they saw a bright flash outside their home, went outside and there were four gray beings standing right next to their house. And she watched them all turn into deer which is also very commonly reported. And then they kind of walked backwards and around the corner of their home. So, so, so I would say about 25% of the reports I get, maybe less, let's say 20% of the reports I get are, are the four foot tall owl. That's interesting. I, I wonder, and, and I'm sure you have thoughts mm-hmm. on it. And, and I, I appreciate what you said earlier as a precursor that, you know, it, there's speculation and everything. Um, but I'm sure you have plenty of thoughts on a lot of this stuff. Uh, I do wonder what it is about the owl that seems to be uh, a, a pretty consistent thing versus these other creatures. Um, and, and when you're talking about screen memories, uh, I think it was episode 17. I mean, this was seven years ago. Uh, I had a guy on talking about when he was a kid in his room. Uh, something was in his room. I don't, don't remember the whole story, but it started flashing um, imagery to him. 
until mm-hmm. it actually settled in on the cartoon character Fred Flintstone. And he's like, I don't know what to tell you. And this is, you know, seven years ago. My my perspective and my thoughts on things have expanded greatly since then. Uh, but I, I didn't know how to to react to it. I'm 17 episodes in. And he's like, I'm telling you, I don't know what it was, but like it was Fred Flintstone standing there. And then I think it was like episode 78. I had a guy on who, and I've had several people talk about this stuff throughout, but these two stick out in my head with the screen memories. Um, he said that he had an action figure in his room that was a toy that he often played with and he he loved. And one day, one night he woke up and that action figure was now standing at the bottom of his bed, but it was three times the size. And so in my head, hearing that stuff, I'm thinking, okay, ch- both of them are children. Um, children, giving them images that are they're familiar with and give them comfort. Uh, but what would it be about owls that would give people comfort? Because quite honestly, they're kind of creepy at night. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you talk to a UFO researcher, and I've talked to many of them, abduction researchers, people focused on the, the, the abduction content, Bud Hopkins, who's since passed on, Leo Sprinkle, I can, I can name a handful of people. They all give the same answer. They say, well, the owls sort of look like aliens, right? The gray alien, if you take a, especially um, the barn owl, the very it's that's one of the spookier looking owls, a very friendly owl, actually. If you want to have a pet owl, that's the one you want. Um, but it's a uh it's a very eerie, spooky owl. So they say, Oh, the reason they use the owls is because the owls sort of look like the gray alien. And that all falls apart when, you know, squirrels and raccoons and deer. I mean, the, so <clears throat> and Fred Flintstone and you know, Jesus actually shows up a lot. Not a lot, but Wow. People will say, "Oh, I woke up and Jesus was at the side of my bed," and and then then they'll have a typical abduction sort of uh, narrative that will play out. Um, so yeah, so that so my sense is, well, yeah. So, but he, for, let's go back to Fred Flintstone. You had it in the sense of uh, it feels like the beings have some rapid fire way to just go into the person's consciousness and pick out what would be most appropriate. For a kid, it would be a toy or a cartoon character. I have a story of a husband and wife. This was on the day they he proposed to her. They were driving down a lonely road and they passed, a, and it's really funny, they said they passed a streetlight and then they talked about it afterwards. This was like, a. This was like there should be no streetlight on this road. It's a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. There shouldn't be a streetlight. So they passed a streetlight and under the streetlight, the woman said, what are those kids doing out at night dressed as ghosts? And the husband said, honey, those are owls. And they went right past them. It wasn't like they were far off in the distance. It was right on the side of the road. So here you have what seems to be two separate, you know, the, you know, they, they chose something out of the, out of the hard drive of, of the, of the wife. And they chose something different out of the hard drive, the internal hard drive, the brain of the, of the husband. So it gets very murky. Um, okay. My answer, and I'm, let me tell you what, I, this answer I'm going to give you, I'm, I am outside the bounds of, let's say what would be normal ufology. Ufology well, is funny. Let me it's just, funny, let me, let me oh, just tell on. you with, with that, what you just said, your home, because that's what I do here. I, I go way outside the bounds okay. of, of what even the ufology or anybody said. I, I prefer to have people thinking outside the box, even if we've never heard it before, I'm like, that's what we're here for. So feel comfortable. Okay. So you ask a UFO abduction researcher, why do they pick the owl as the screen memory? And they'll say, oh, it's because they look like owls. But now my strong sense is, doesn't make it true, but it's my strong sense, is that the owl is an archetype. Right? So an archetype I mean, this is funny. I ask, I've, I, I meet a lot of people who are professors and doctorates and they have doctorates in philosophy and stuff like that. I always ask them the same question, like, give me your definition of archetype. They always give me a different answer. Like, it's like, there's no good answer for archetype. So my answer would be an archetype is something that we have as humanity in our collective knowing. Like we have an appreciation and understanding of a, of a symbolic meaning of an owl that is sort of embedded in our DNA. So cultures all across the world have a similar mythology around owls. There's a similar pop culture content around owls. So we have embedded in our minds 
an ancient symbolic definition of what an owl might mean. So my answer would be, that is why they are presenting us with an owl. They are presenting us with an archetype. Now, a deer is also a powerful archetype too. It has a different mythic meaning, as does Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, Clowns are commonly reported. This is funny that every, everyone in the UFO research community knows that clowns are often reported. And then their next thing is like, doesn't that like play out like the weird fear of clowns that so many people have? And then like this clown yeah. archetype, don't, shouldn't they like know that like that's the worst thing they can have show up in a little kid's room at night? Um, but uh, so my argument would be that they are presenting us with an archetype. Just because I'm saying that doesn't make it true, but wow, do the puzzle pieces sort of click in place when you when you use that as a as a way to frame just the screen memory aspect? Oh, let, so let me add now. In, I wrote a big fat book called The Messengers. It's all about this owl and UFO stuff. And I've since, that came out about, oh, yikes, nine years ago. And and in the intervening years, I've, I was, I'm less locked into some of the ideas I put forward very forcefully. I still, I still, those are strong ideas, but I've, I'm a little more nuanced in them. So what I can say is, as I said earlier, once you've heard the screen memory story, the four foot tall owl, 500 times. You get it. There's something there. I would also say that's about 20%, 15, 20, 25%. I can't give a good number, but it's a smaller proportion of the overall reports I'm getting. The overall reports I'm getting are of real owls. And so real owls showing up at the time, not just of not just around the time of a UFO contact experience, we've got plenty of those, but also at the at, around the time of other highly charged experiences in someone's life. There, oh, sorry. And, and if I get on a roll and you want to interrupt, you just you just butt right in. So. No, I, I'm actually I enjoy when my guests actually talk. So feel free to talk as much as you want. Uh, so there, there's plenty of things we we can pull out here, and um, I, I, I at some point I would like to just kind of lay the groundwork for the audience to understand who you are as far as how you got involved in this because mm -hmm. I do think that does help define why you're so invested in this because it clearly was the launching point for you. Uh, but I will I want to say this a couple of things. One, I'm going to bring this up not knowing uh, how to go forward once I bring it up because I don't know much about it. Uh, but I have a friend who is one of my cameramen for my documentaries, and he. Uh, came out with a docu series called Dark Holler, and it a lot of it has to do with uh, Lilith, and I don't know if you've heard of Lilith. Oh uh, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. But um, and 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 he's constantly pointing out birds to me. I'm like he's like like he's I've never said this to him and stuff, but just thinking about it, I'm like he's my bird friend. Like he he's but it has something to do with Lilith. I just don't totally understand because he hasn't sat down to tutor me on it. Uh, but uh, he he brings. The, the, the idea of owls up, Lilith up. And he even brought this up with me just yesterday. Uh, we recently started a private discord between him, me, and a couple other guys uh, where we're, we're just jotting down things that come across our path just to kind of keep a journal of it almost together. And, um, and I, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to say this, but I'm going to say it. Uh, I'm going to kind of tell you what just happened last night. It's not... <laughs> It's, yeah. <laughs> okay, bring it on, bring it on. Yeah, so um, so I, I do want to because there's more owl stories I have for you. Uh, all right, let, actually, let me let me just start from the beginning and I, just give me a few minutes here. Um, so the audience listening right now, by net, by the time they hear this, they will have known this. Well, if they're members to my to 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 the podcast, they'll have known the story because this is gonna be a members episode. Uh, I had a guy come in studio two Saturdays ago and he was telling me different stories and experiences. He was originally on my episode 510 and um, it was a good conversation. And then he said to me, uh, I, he was really hesitant and he's like, I have to, I want to tell you something else. I have one more thing to tell you. He's kind of like just kind of dawdling around with it. And he's like, it has to do with you. And, you know, I get people telling me a lot, you know, hey, I had a dream about you or I, I, I think you should because you know, God told me, or I have a feeling or whatever. Um, and a lot of times, like I'm a Christian and I, 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 I but the way I live my life is if, if God isn't kind of telling me first, I, 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 I try not to put too much credence in what a, a man is telling me God is saying for me, you know? 
Uh, and so I, I'm already kind of hesitant with what he's, <laughs> he's gearing up to do. Now, but mind you, this guy uh, is here in Tennessee. He's a He's a, a worship leader at his church. He's a deacon at his church. He's a he's a he's a more spiritual person when it comes to his Christian faith. Um, and he says, uh, and I will tell you this before I tell you this. He his previous story he had just shared with me is that he had for the first time ever in his life after his initial story that he was on the show with. Since then, he had an experience where he had like an out of body experience where he was lifted up in his bedroom, where his 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 inner man was not his his physical body is on the bed. And he's up towards the ceiling and he looks to the side out of his window and there's a gray alien entity standing there. And then he tells me this, this, this story that involves me where um, basically he asked me if a certain number meant anything to me. And immediately it did. I looked at my brother who's live producing the show. I look back at the guest and I tell him, uh, we can't talk about this here. And, th- and I, 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 we, I, I think I said, we can't talk about the number here or something like that. And he said, okay. So he kind of starts talking without talking about the number. And he starts describing a dream that he had where uh, he saw me at my house outside. And he proceeds to accurately describe my driveway, the way it's shaped, my house, the house color, the way my road is leading up to my driveway and how my driveway cuts off, how my house is positioned on the property. And my mind was blown at this point. And then he later confirmed by sketching my house on paper. Like, like he, he drew my house. I was like, holy cow. Like, this isn't even just like similarity. Like he had the door placement down everything. Um, so in that story, he uh, says that he saw two black cloaked figures walking behind me into my house as, as they followed me into my house that night. Uh, I say these two stories because after he had left, I don't know what it was. Maybe I knew you were coming up this week. Uh, but I said to him, Hey, I text him after he left. I said, do you, do you remember seeing owls at all it, it, since you, you had started having these experiences? He said, you know, we have an owl outside our house that my kids hoot at all the time. It's always there hooting. And I was like, interesting. I don't know what that means, but that's what, that, that, that's his experience. Uh, and then just last night, you know, I, I know I have you coming up because I, I plan ahead for these interviews. I know who I have the next day. And um, I'm sitting in my kitchen. My wife goes out. We have pigs in the backyard. Uh, and so we save food scraps for the pigs. And she goes to dump the, the, the dinner scraps into the bucket that we have outside. And she comes in and she goes, uh, I know you're going to think I'm crazy because of you know, your interview tomorrow and everything that's been going on. She said, uh, I, I just heard a weird sounding critter that I'd never heard before. And it was a, she said it was a mix between a weird sounding critter and, and this is pop culture reference, but uh, she said it, it was a mix between a weird sounding critter and the seagull from the little mermaid trying to sing. And then immediately following that, she said a very large owl flew by her hooting. And then she comes inside and tells me this. And she told me that it was a big owl. And she sent me a picture and she said, think of this owl only only uh, flying. And then just this morning, I wake up and before I even leave the house to take my son to school, uh, I venture onto the good old Instagram and the very first sponsored ad that comes up on my Instagram, uh, I was like, I was, I was shocked and kind of like, like you got to be kidding me. And, maybe, and I don't know if it's like me just seeing owls everywhere now, but the first sponsored ad was for a media company uh, that I don't want to say the media company's name out loud because I don't want to put them on the spot with this conversation if they don't want it. But um, uh, it, it has Owl in the name of it. And uh, it's a woman uh, uh, advertising their media company next to my, in my town in Knoxville. And so like, I'm thinking to myself, is that a coincidence? I don't know. But Owl sure does seem to be popping up a lot since I scheduled Mike Cleland to be on my show. <laughs> so uh, I, I say all that and I, I, I don't know what got me going on that stuff, but I just kind of want to share that with you because um, it, it, I'm sure you've heard it before that owls tend to kind of pop up where you, where you tend to tread your feet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like if I, oh, oh, it, what you've just shared is like, I don't want to say, a, so I do a lot of podcasts. 
like a lot. And so yeah. like I got books and I'm self-published and like someone asked me like, what's your media plan? What's your marketing plan? I'm like, uh, I say yes to people who want to do a podcast and that's about it. So, um, but I don't, I'm going to be really careful to say a hundred percent cause that would be wrong, but it's a lot. Wow. It is a lot of people who tell stories just like that. I had one guy. So the, my, 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 the core of my research, it goes, it spreads out a little further than just this tight little thing at the center, but it's owls and UFOs specifically UFO contact. And then, so this guy, his name is Juan. He's got a pod and how he got a hold of me is a funny story. It's like Phil. Is it one on one podcast? One on one. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. He's a friend of mine. He's just here a few weeks ago. Oh, so, so Juan so <laughs> gets a hold of me. It's funny. He actually, I won't tell you how he got a hold of me. The, the story will go on forever, but um, so we're going to do a podcast. It's the next day. It's the night. He's with his wife and his kid. He's got a very young kid. I think he's like five or so, a little, mm. like a boy. And he's in the backyard. It's nighttime. And he's like, you know, I'm going to interview the owl guy tomorrow. I'm going to interview that owl guy tomorrow. Maybe I'll, maybe. And then his son goes, dad, look. And an orange orb floats through the backyard. So wow. he's thinking, I'm going to see an owl. His son says, hey, look. And they, they, they're confronted with a UFO. This is like, this is like straight out of my, my research. This is a hundred percent the kind of thing I'm finding. You're looking for an owl, you see a UFO. I got the other way around too. You're looking for a UFO, you see an owl. It's just, so there's this flip floppy blendy thing that goes on. And I ha I could tell that story in one form or another. I could fill up three hours of podcast hosts seeing owls before or after the recording. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Or having some sort of, like playful, absurd owl synchronicity. Yeah. So. Jack, a quirky producer with a passion for baking apple pies and setting them on his windowsill, found himself in a peculiar situation. His pies kept vanishing. Suspecting mischievous neighborhood kids, Jack turned to Simply Safe's 60 day risk free trial to catch the culprits. He was all about saving a buck, but he was ready for a lifetime commitment if Simply Safe could solve this mystery. Equipped with Simply Safe's advanced tech, which protects every nook and cranny of a home and monitors 24 7 any suspicious activity, Jack awaited the thief's next move. As the days got longer and Jack enjoyed the daylight, Knowing his home was secure, he got the surprise of his life. The thief wasn't kids, it was Bigfoot. Simply Safe's cameras captured the giant creature tiptoeing to take the pie, thinking Jack had left them as gifts. Jack burst into laughter at the footage. What he thought would be a simple catch and scold turned into an unbelievable discovery, making him an overnight sensation and an accidental Bigfoot buddy. Thanks to Simply Safe, not only was Jack's home safer than ever, but he also solved the hilarious mystery of his missing pies. He went from wanting a short trial to becoming a lifelong Simply Safe user, all because of an apple pie loving Bigfoot. Protect your home today. My listeners get up to 20% off any new Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com slash confessionals. That's simplysafe.com slash confessionals. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's definitely uh, something that stood out to me. And when I text my group of guys, they, they, they found it interesting as well. Uh, and so uh, before we get too carried away with everything, um, which I we normally I, I drop this stuff in the beginning, but I had forgot about I'll, I'll do it in the intro. Uh, you are an author of several books. The main book you already uh, mentioned, it, which is The Messengers. Uh, and uh, people can check that out at mycleland.com. Uh, you are Mike Cleland. And uh, if you could, uh, at this point, though, kind of, this is how I normally would have started out the show, but I had to bring up the four foot owls and, and jump right into the deep end. Uh, could you uh, let the audience know your background, though, with how this kind of came together for you? Because uh, it's not like one day you woke up and, and you were always just interested in owls and you decided to try to connect owls to your other fascination, which is UFOs and aliens. This was something that uh, kind of almost sought you out in a way. Sure. Oh, yeah. So <clears throat> I've told this story many times, and I can kind of go on autopilot, but but sure. I'll try to tell this quick. To, I could tell this story. I could take an hour to tell this story. And there are 
coincidences and synchronicities and deeper meanings and all these little threads are tangled up in this one story. But okay. 2006. I'm, I'm, that's 18 years ago. Um, I was 44 then I'm 61 now. I think I got that right. So I was living in uh, a little town in Idaho, right next to the Wyoming border. And I was working for an outdoor school. I was doing a lot of outdoor work. I was going to Alaska. I was teaching month long courses. I was teaching skiing in the winter in the outdoors. I was teaching mountaineering and wilderness travel in the summers. And, and so I had been in Alaska all summer. I got back down to the lower 48 and I was in my little town and I met this woman and she had been living in the town too. So the town I lived in is right next to Grand Teton National Park. It's gorgeous, really. So we had this conversation and then she's, I was like, hey, I just got back into town and I'm like, oh, you must have been camping all summer long. She said, I never went camping once. And I was like, that's terrible. It's beautiful here. I'll take you camping. Total stranger. This is like a first date, which, which in a camping culture like that is well understood. It's no big deal. But I, I've told that to other people. I'm like, you took someone camping on a first date? And I'm like, eh, well, sort of, yeah. So, so her name is Kristen. We're still good friends. And well, I, I was, te- I also teach uh, I, I, a form of like really ultralight backpacking. I, I, I used to teach it. I haven't done it in a few years, but um, so we went out for one night, took very little gear, light packs, beautiful night. I knew how to read the weather, the weather report, and it was going to be a gorgeous night. So we didn't take a shelter. We didn't take a tent. We're just going to sleep out under the stars. So I go in with Kristen and where we go with a light pack and starting in the afternoon, we go deep into the mountains and we're in this beautiful spot in the in the Tetons, which is a fantastic, glorious place. And the sun is setting and I'm sitting on a big flat rock and I've been out all summer. I'm totally in my element. I'm cooking a, on a little camp stove and we're talking and I get this moment. I'm like, whoa, this woman is really smart. This woman is really thoughtful. This woman is has a depth that like I did not expect. And I'm like, I'm impressed. And at that moment, an owl flies over. And then a second owl, and then a third owl. And for the next like two hours, as the sun sets, these owls fly around us. So we were, we were in bear country. So what we did is we cooked in one spot and then we like cleaned everything up and we walked another half mile and camped somewhere else. So, so we just found a spot to camp and we, and these owls are following us and there's, and we lie down on our backs under the stars. Now this is the Northern Rockies. This is way far away from light pollution. This is a trillion billion glorious stars so we're lying on our back and these owls are like going right over our faces and they blot out the stars for one microsecond it was absolutely magical owls are very quiet in flight so there's nothing to hear but just this like blink blink like the like this the heavens were blinking it was remarkable the next morning we get up like wow that was cool and i said hey let's go camping again anytime you want let's do it so four days later we go camping again totally different part of the mountains as the sun setting three owls appear. Now I'm convinced they were the same three owls. We we're miles away. They certainly could be, but I'm, but I, and there's no way I can prove it, but that's my very strong sense of the same three owls. These are normal owls, little 11 inch, 11 inch tall owls are kind of owl called a short eared owl, pretty common. And three owls fly around us. Now before they were kind of off in the distance and, and this second time they were like landing at our feet. I have this, I have this memory of Kristen seared into my mind where she's just like astonished, just, just absolutely astonished that this owl is standing at our, at our feet. Now, let me back up a little bit. Leading up to this, I had been looking into and reading a lot of UFO literature, books written by UFO researchers, books written by people who claim the direct contact experience, who claim abduction. Now, I had a series of events in my youth that sure sound like UFO contact. I have a missing time event that is with an associated bright light in the sky. I have a, I saw a UFO out a window, which seemed to be very close when I was about 12 years old. And then I have a, this is a little more telling, but I have a memory when I was 30, half my lifetime ago, when I woke up in the middle of the night, sat up in bed, looked out the window, bright light pouring in, and there were five gray aliens walking towards the house. And I just said, I had a voice in my head that said, ooh, 
Now is the time to shut down, put your head on the pillow and black out. And that's exactly what I did. And I, the next day I dismissed it all as nothing but a dream, but wow, am I skeptical of what may or may not have happened that night now. So, so I was at a point at this point in 2006 with Kristen where I was, I was like, like, I got to someday look into this, right? I got to, I got to, I got to look into what may or may not have happened in my life. At the same time, I was no way, no way, not me, uh uh-uh, not going there, full denial. Like, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to look into this. Nuh-uh. So, but boy, I could tell these stories around a campfire, around a dinner table and like, isn't that interesting? Yeah, isn't that interesting? I like saw this weird orange flash and then came home and I was two hours late and my parents were angry at me. I would have been 12 years old at that time. And so when I saw the owls in the mountains with Kristen, two times, three owls, two different parts of the mountain, four days apart, both times I had this thought in my head that said, this has something to do with the UFOs. Right now, now I'm at a point where I'm like, was that my own voice or was this like an outside projection? But it was a very clear voice in my head. This has something to do with the UFOs. I'm looking at real owls, little cute owls. And I was well aware that owls show up in the context of, of UFO events at that point. I didn't, I didn't invent that. It's other people have articulated that very clearly before I came along. I'm the one who went kind of wiggy about it and, and wrote four books on it. So, um, so, so I, st- so afterwards, after these owl events, Kristen and I both, this is in the early days of the internet, this 2009, so, or 2006. So we're like Googling like, uh, like owl mythology and owl symbolism. And it's like, just, we're, we're both making ourselves crazy. And, and because I had that voice in my head, I was not only looking into the owl mystery, I was reaching out to UFO researchers. So that was the beginning of me looking into my own direct experiences. Wow. And now I started a blog in 2009. That was three years later. After that event, Kristen was only spending the summer in, um, uh, in the valley where I was living. So she moved out, but we've kept in touch. And so I started a blog and I told exactly this story, the story of camping with Kristen. Now I get on the phone, I call her up. It's the blog post is already up. It's the second blog post on my blog. I call her up and I say, the first night, the first night when we were talking about those owls, or before the, excuse me, before the owls appeared, you were talking about something. And I remember I was, I was impressed. I remember you're talking about something spiritual. What were you talking about? I can't remember. And she said, oh, I remember exactly what I was talking about. I was giving my deepest, most heartfelt definition of what God means to me. And that happened at the very first moment. Now, this is three years after I had totally taken the deep dive. And like, I will say an unhealthy obsession into these mysteries. I was, I was, I was a, I'm a much calmer person now. I was not that way at the time. And so she hits me with this, with this, this thing about like, oh, we were talking about God, right? When the owls appeared. Now I'm, let's, I'm not at all churchy. I grew up going to a Lutheran church. I stopped going to church when I was 15. And, but I, I fully recognize, let's say the archetypal power of, of what she said. Like, I recognize the power in that statement, the mystical power in that statement. And, and what it took, it took my research that I was doing kind of haphazardly at that point. I'm a little more formal about it now. And it, it made me say, no, no, no. I have to, like, there is something here. Like, I have to be open to the biggest ideas. I mean, I think that there would be other UFO researchers that would hear that. And they just put that in the, they put that in the, the gray bin and they're not going to worry about that claim. But that, that, so that was a long, long, long thing about how I got into this. So what happened is I started looking to my own direct set of experiences, which involve UFOs. Seemingly, I started looking to the owl thing, 
So I kind of doing those simultaneously. So when I talk to a UFO witness or an experiencer, I say, hey, by the way, let me add one question to the, your mic. Have you ever had any odd experiences with owls? And they'll go, whoa, man, like, that's so funny you should ask. No one's ever asked me that. I have the weirdest story. And then they would tell me a story. And I'd figure out a way to write it down. And I kept little files. And then I had a blog and I put a little thing in the blog said, I want to hear your owl stories. Didn't take long before. If you were anywhere, anywhere in the world and you sat down at your computer, you can do it right now. You can just type in UFOs, owls. I'm the first thing that comes up. I'm about the next 15 things below that. And so anyone with a, with a mouse, I'm two mouse clicks away. Anyone who has a, an, a profound owl experience that involves a UFO, I'm about two mouse clicks away. And they're going to find me. And the top of my blog says, I want to hear your owl stories. So it used to be I'd get like one or two a week, and then it was one or two a day. And now it's about, I got to be really careful. It's been crazy. It's about six a day. Six like powerful owl stories a day. Maybe let's, that's a little high. I'm going to say most days of the week, I'm getting three plus. I'm, people say, hey, I saw a pretty owl on the fence in my backyard. It's really neat, really beautiful. My husband and I saw it and like, okay, that's a nice story. That's not going in, that's like, that's not going in the files. I'm talking about like absolutely mystical, powerful. And, and, and I would say the majority of the accounts I'm getting, none of them involve UFOs anymore. They're just owls that have, that have, that have a mystical resonance to the observer. Do you think that the increase of reports that you've been experiencing is just a mere consequence of you being out there long enough or do you think that there is an uptick in this stuff that people are looking into because it's standing out to more and more people i think it's more that 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 it's easier to search people have heard my name you you know like all of a sudden i'm out there a little bit yeah so i think it's just a matter of it's basically the internet is allowing this this to percolate in a way that would have been impossible a decade ago yeah i guess as as time goes on uh, it, it recognizes who's being most trafficked for certain things and then just automatically recommends them. Uh, that's good. Um, the, the owls that people are seeing, big, small, uh, have you noticed uh, any kind of uh, synchronicities with certain stories? Uh, like, you know, this person over here said they saw a four-foot owl and then this happened. And this person said the same thing and then something similar happened. And have you... Have you noticed uh, like the, the the situation with the owl experience towards an experience? Uh, any kind of synchronicities with that? So 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 there's the real owl events, and then there's the four foot tall owl events. So the four foot tall owl events sort of fall into the to the category of screen memory. The real owl events, wow, those are tough. I mean, you can once you wrap your mind around the fact. Well, okay, someone saw a four foot tall owl. They're on this lonely road. They're probably a missing time event. Uh, you know. It fits over here. The, the, the real owls showing up at the time of a... Well, here, let me back up a little bit. There are five things. One of them is UFO contact or UFO events. Owls are most certainly seen around the time of UFO events. Not 100%. Just because you have a UFO event doesn't mean you're seeing an owl. Just because you have an owl sighting doesn't mean you're going to have a UFO sighting. There's like, but there's a, there's a consistency. Wow, there's a consistency enough to make a pattern. That was the that was a premise of my first books, but I, there's more. So so the other ones would be owls and meditation. People meditating. I got a lot of stories about people meditating and seeing owls. Owls and shamanic initiation. This is well understood in the community of shamans, which exists. There's practicing shamans. There's a there's a there's a mentorship process that takes place. But people going through the shamanic initiation will see owls. Very consistent. Owls and psychedelics, most particularly mushrooms, people will see owls. And often in a, like a ritual kind of mushroom experience where they're taking it as a, as a sort of spiritual thing. I got a lot of stories of that. And then lesser other, other psychedelics. And then owls and death. Wow, if there's one thing that if I was going to write a book about something else, I would write, well, that's, I should be careful what I say. But owls and death would be the big one where, and this is well understood by people doing death research, that owls show up at the time of, of death. Now, what the lore is, what the mythology is, is that owls, like the hooting of the owl will, will be a, will be a, 
precursor will be will foreshadow someone death this shows up in shakespeare it shows up in movies all the time it's right there it's in our folklore that's not what i'm finding i get some reports like that but that's the majority of the reports i'm getting are where where someone's parent it's usually a parent or a loved one will die and shortly thereafter an owl will arrive at their home and they'll talk to this owl or, the, or near, and they'll talk to this owl as if it is their dead parent and i have many stories where the the grieving process will be eliminated as they talk to a to a physical like a regular owl lands in a branch in the backyard they go out and talk to it and their 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 grieving is eliminated i have a story of a guy whose father died of a heart attack he's leaving the hospital he walks out the the doors, the automatic doors open middle of the night. He spent the whole afternoon day at the hospital. He's leaving in the middle of the night after his father died of a massive heart attack. He's on the little, he's on the sidewalk and right on the grass next to the sidewalk. He's all alone. Middle of the night is a little owl. And he walks up to this owl and the owl looks up at him. The owl doesn't fly away. And he says, dad, I love you. I'm honored that you could have been my father. It meant so much to me. I'll always treasure your role as my father. That I have that story with such consistency. That alone, like so, the so I, the owl has an ominous lore, but wow, this beautiful stories I've heard like that kind of just make it's a much more nuanced totem than just the spooky owl in a haunted house movie Mm -hmm. so your question was how do i separate or what patterns am i seeing so the pattern is that these five events uh owls and ufos owls and meditation owls and shamanic initiation owls and psychedelics owls and death i would call those highly charged human experience so the owl is not connected necessarily with the ufo It is connected with a high, it is a highly charged human experience. The owl is connected to a highly charged human experience of which UFO contact certainly is one of them. So if that's the pattern I'm seeing, that's what it's connected to. So that's what I'm much more interested in. There are outlying things that sort of show up, but wow, I, for instance, the near death experience feels like it should be on that list. I, I got no evidence. No, I've got no stories of out. There might be out there, but I just don't have them. And I have to have a handful of them before they turn into a pattern. And um, here, a couple things: people who have UFO and owl expect UFO owls. Though that combination, when I talk to them, a couple things very common. They'll say, "Oh, I had a spiritual awakening just after this stuff." Or my life changed direction in a much more spiritual way. I could say that about my owl experience with Kristen. I mean, I was doing one thing. I, I transferred into another whole different career. And, and I have a sort of spiritual bend to the way, or mystical or whatever. The spiritual is a funny word. It's a tough one to pin down. But I certainly am open to that spiritual side of it. Now, the another thing that shows up, you know what Reiki is, Reiki therapy? Yes. Okay. People have UFO contact in in connection with an owl. I will. I would say this is a. a I, I haven't crunched the numbers. It's tough, but anecdotally, fifty percent of the people who have owl and UFO experiences are Reiki healers. Hmm. Like I'll tell you what, fifty percent of the normal population are not Reiki healers. So, so you ask. There's a weird one. Like, and if it's not Reiki directly, it's another form of. Very similar uh, energy healing that they'll be doing a modality of energy healing. So, so this is this is very mysterious to me that 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 that's not a little blip in the in the statistics. That's a big, yeah. impressive number of yeah. That's okay. that, that's huge. That's a huge number. Um, get outside of the number one on that list of five UFO. Uh, the other four traditionally are easily viewed as uh, spirit world, interdimensional, other realm, trans- transcending realms. And now, uh, you know, it used to be considered crazy talk in the UFO world, but even the, the government and these whistleblowers coming out are putting 
more they they won't say it the way I say it, but they, they they say it in almost like their own code way. It's like we're telling you what's going on without actually saying it because we don't want you to <laughs> to hear it from us. Uh, but it seems like these UFOs have an interdimensional quality to them as well, and and the way they're talking about them just appearing. Uh, through even at, at times I've heard this happen a lot where it's like almost like a slit of light and this thing comes out of it. Uh, so with with those five lists, I think the, the, we can we can comfortably say, given the, the definition of UFO that I just gave, uh, there is some kind of spirit realm, spirit, uh, other dimensional type aspect to this whole thing uh, that you're talking about. And if I remember correctly, and this might be way more than just the Native Americans, but I, I think the Native Americans, um, they they viewed owls as like messengers to go in and out of the spirit realm. Uh, is that is that is that correct, or is that maybe the wrong culture? Oh, that's that's so Native American is tough, right? Because it's like you know, there's tribes on the Atlantic coast, which are very different than tribes in the Pacific coast. There's tribes in the desert Southwest, which are very different from the tribes up in, in, in the Yukon. So, but the, the, so here, the consistent consistency, it's tough, right? Cause it, cause there's lots of mythology about owls. There's lots of mythology about deers. There's lots of mythology about, you know, sunrises. So, but, but the, the, the owl mythology the owl can see in the darkness. The owl can see in complete darkness, right? So ancient man would have known that the owl flies at night. Now, just a few generations ago, the night must have meant something totally different to humanity. Before the electric light bulb, the night had a powerful mystique to it that is sort of lost now that we we can generate our own light with electricity. But our mythologies rose out of that ancient lore so the owl could fly in complete darkness, was completely comfortable flying in the forest at night. This is different than the eagle that flies in the bright sky, the bright empty sky during the day. The owl flies at night in the darkness. The And, and that very quickly turned into, let's just say quickly, that within the, the lore, within the mythologies, the owl travels to the land of the dead, travels to the land of the ancestors, travels to the land of the gods, travels to that other realm, and returns with a message. And so, and, and uh, Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom, had a companion little owl. It's actually a little owl. So if she's seen with an owl, it's like a little seven-inch tall, six-inch tall owl, often on her wrist in, in artwork and in statues and such. So in the, that's where we get the owl as wise. The goddess of wisdom had a companion owl. Um, now, present day, the most popular series of books in the history of publication is Harry Potter. Harry Potter has an owl that delivers the mail. It is perfect. It's perfect. It's the owl as messenger. It's right there. It's not in some dusty book on a shelf in an in a old library. It's present day pop culture right now, owl as messenger. Not, not like often the, it's right there at the forefront of our pop culture. So the owl would be the intermediary between our realm and that other realm. And that is, that's the, all the things on that modality, including the UFO contact things, wherever the UFO occupants are from it ain't from here whether they're from another planet i'm open to that but let me tell you like how to say this i talk to people all the time who claim to have had direct ufo contact if you watch a late night documentary right or i'm, I'm kind of using you know, cable TV. If you stream a documentary on UFO content <laughs> at noon on a Wednesday, <laughs> on any time you want, you watch it on your phone while you're waiting in the bank. Yes, yeah, so waiting in line at the bank. So if you if you watch the story that emerges, oh, the people are taken from their car at night and they're taken onto board a UFO and they're put on a table and creepy medical exams are being done. I've heard those stories. I the conversations I've had with people and they when they and they tell me that is essentially never. I mean, it's sometimes, it's like less than 1%. What I'm hearing is, I had a powerful 
UFO sighting. And, and then afterwards, I had mystical events. I had psychic events. I had, this is the one that's overwhelming. I had synchronicities, coincidences of such magnitude that it has forced me to rethink the fabric of reality. Wow, that is the consistent thread. It's not lying on a table in a flying saucer. So, so that's the thread I'm pulling on is that, is that mystical thread. Part of it is I'm completely like this, is my own research. I don't have to, like, I, I, I want to be a, I want to be a competent journalist in the way I give the information, but I am not subjective. I'm, excuse me, I'm not objective. I'm com- totally subjective. I am, I am doing this for completely selfish reasons. I had my own direct owl and UFO type experiences. I, want an answer. I, I, I got a lot of questions. I've got some interesting data points. I have, I'm very shy to say that, like what answers I may or may not have. Yeah. And I think, uh, as you've done this, uh, as long as you have been, you've come up with a lot of answers, but, uh, do you still feel like there's questions that you really don't have answered? Like you've had questions that over the years uh, have either answered, you have a pretty strong inkling that this is how you feel like this is going. And is there, has there been things over the years that have popped up that you're just like, I just don't have an answer to this yet. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. All the, uh, like six times a day when I open my email inbox. <laughs> <laughs> <I gotcha. laughs> so, so, so uh, that, that, that was a little bit provocative. I guess. So, so here, let me just, I'll just, Okay. Two stories. I'm going to tell two stories back to back. I get these funny stories. They arrive back to back, like they mirror each other. So this, this two stories, um, this guy, Bert Jansen, he's a Dutch researcher and he does crop circle researcher research in, in, uh, and has been for decades now in England. And he, this is going back in the nineties. He's walking through the fields. Sun is setting. He's in the crop circle country. He's thinking like, I'm done. I've been doing this for a few summers now, researching the crop circle. Like, pfft, I'm done with it. Like, move on. Like, what am I going to learn? What am I going to learn? And then there's this orange orb that floats through the field. And he's standing there in the field and the sun is setting. And this orange orb is floating the field. It gets tiny, like the size of a ping pong ball and grows big to the size of a beach ball. And it floats around and it floats along the edge of the field. And there's a shed there. And it goes behind the shed and he's kind of watching it go along. And it kind of, and it, it goes behind the shed and it doesn't come out the other side. And he's like, could it be that the, did the, did the orange orb go in the shed? So he goes up to the shed door and it's locked and he puts his ear to the door and he hears this awful noise. Here's this awful, horrible noise, this hiss, this grim, creepy hiss noise. And he's like, oh my word. So he goes around the back. Where, where, so, if he, so the back, it would have, and then right at the height where the, where the orb would have been floating is a window and there's a broken, the glass is broken in the window. And he's like, did the, did the orb go in there? And he comes back and, and so he can't get in and he's, it's nighttime. So he comes back the next day and he puts his ear to the, to the door and it hears that hiss. And so he, he says, okay, I'm, he breaks the door. I'm, this is like, I love this. He, he said, I broke the lock. <laughs> And he went in and there was a ladder in a loft and up there was, was where the window would have been. And he hears this hiss up in the loft and he climbs the ladder and he peeks over the edge and it's a family of barn owls and they make an awful noise. It is like haunted house, creepy as it gets noise, baby barn owls. Let's Google it. It's awful. So he looks, he's like, wait, I saw an orange orb. It led me to these, to these owls. Could it be? That the owl and the orange orb are essentially the same thing. He said it. He said it clearly 25 years before I started, or 15 years before I started my research. So, another story. This woman, Maria, we- Maria Wheatley, she does crop circle research and more, more of um, ancient sites, ancient mystical sites in the, in, Europe and the UK and such. And so she goes to ancient sites and does this research. Now she was with a friend and they were going to go on a walk and sun is setting and they walk down this path and they park their car and they, they get in the car and they start walking down the path. And as soon as they get a little ways down the path, an owl flies in front of them. 
and crosses their path and they both get the same, they both 100% feel the same thing. It's like, we're not allowed down this path. We can't cross that line. The owl crossed our path. We can't cross that line. So they turn around and they say, let's walk up to the top of this hill site. So they walk up to the hill site, which is called Oliver's Castle. And there's no castle there, but that's the name of the hill in England. It's right in crop circle country. And they're at the top of the hill and it's beautiful. And then all of a sudden off in the distance, what is that? And this orange orb starts floating towards them. And then it gets big and then it turns into the size of a giant, huge cigar. And then poof, it disappears. And they're like, they're freaked out. And they run back down and, and Maria says, the guy was like, oh, he couldn't get his key in his car. He was shaking so bad. So they went to the pub, England. They go to the pub and the, the guy says, I can read the mind. I can read everyone's mind. Like, I know what everyone's thinking. I know I can read everyone's mind in the pub. It, that lessened over time. Maria was doing tarot reading right after the event. She was continued to do tarot reading. Her ability to do tarot readings was like amplified enormously. So, so here are two separate things. Maria has an owl that leads her to an orange orb, a, a UFO. Bert has an orange orb, a UFO, that leads him to an owl. Bert was saying, I'm going to quit. What can I learn? What can I learn about UFO? Uh, excuse me. What, can I, what more can I learn about crop circles? He's at the point, I'm done. That was close to 30 years ago. He's been at it ever since. Maria Wheatley has been his full-time research into, into esoteric mysteries. So this is... This is the pattern that I'm seeing. Hmm. You know, I wanted to make sure I hit on on something here. Uh, and I know there's plenty of, of imagery out there, but why do you think that people use owls in um, their marketing tools for logos and things like that? Uh, do you think that there's, there's a, a, an absolute deep understanding of what the owl is that they do that? Or... You know, like, and there's things like um, the the musician. Well, if you want to call him a musician, that's fine. His name's Drake, and uh, he he's uh, he, his whole thing is owl. Like he has he has uh, the owl as his logo, and you know, he, there's uh, even even to the um, uh, what do you call it in in uh, California uh, the Bohemian Grove? Oh, the, Bohemian Grove, yeah, yeah, the giant statue, the owl statue. I mean, it seems like there's this, um, I don't know, like this uh, uh, symbology that is understood mm -hmm. and and utilized. Uh, I mean, surely, I mean, you you finished my sentence for me with Bohemian Grove. I mean, what do you what do you make of that? Why would why would a secret society be so interested in having a giant statue of an owl? In, on, on their property and things like that. So I can't answer exactly why they would have chosen it. I can speculate and say that the owl is directly tied into Athena, the goddess of wisdom. She's also the goddess of commerce, the goddess of warfare, the goddess of arts and crafts, but she's most known as the goddess of wisdom. So you have a men's society that's like a bunch mm -hmm. of rich white guys in, in like, this is a hundred year old society that they're, they're well-versed in the classics of, of literature and, and, classicism and so so that they picked an owl traces right back to the goddess athena so on the on the door to the bohemian club it there's a little plaque it says weaving spiders come not here and that traces back to the to the myth of arachnia which was a woman who was a who was a she was making tapestries. She was weaving tapestries. And so she weaved a tapestry more beautiful than the gods could weave. And so, so Athena, the goddess of arts and crafts, was weaving a tapestry. Arachnia, this other woman, was made a more beautiful tapestry than the goddess Athena. And the goddess Athena turned her into a spider. So that's a direct, right on the door, it's, it's a direct representation of a, of a, of Athena, the goddess Athena. So, and I'll also say, so the, so we have the, it traces back into our ancient lore, the goddess. Um, as far as Drake and kind of haunted houses and, and the owl is a symbol of the night and not just the night, but the, the shadow element, the spooky side of things. Um, there's a, there's a plaque of what seems to be Lilith. There's no good 
answer. But often people say that is Lilith, and then there's not a good answer if it is or not. But there's a plaque in the London Museum, and I've stood in front of it, and it's a it's a tiny little plaque, and it's terracotta, and it's a very very old, bo- uh, uh, um, Babylonian image of of this goddess. She has talons for feet. She has two lions next to her, and then she's flanked by two owls. And so that 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 and the Lilith is not uh, like a like a Lilith is a is like the shadow side of of femininity. And so in lots of lore, Lilith was a vampire. And she could fly around and drink the blood of babies. She would turn into an owl, like modern vampires. We have them; they turn into bats. But in the ancient lore, Lilith would turn into an owl, go and drink the blood of babies. So it's a really, really dark mythology, and and I think that has stayed with us. Um, owls show up in the Bible, depending on the translation, about seventeen times. Each time, it is in. It is exactly the same way. A modern storyteller would say, oh, there's a spooky story, and I walked into the woods and there was an owl hooting. You're setting the the scene with an owl in order to make it seem frightening or barren or empty or the wilderness or that empty shadow thing. So, um, as I said before, the owl flies at night. The eagle, which is a also full of mythology and full of resonance, flies in the bright sunshine. And there's, they have two totally different meanings as far as their, their mythic meaning. Hmm. I'm not sure if I answered your question. I do this thing where you ask a question. I go around the block a few times. No, you're so you're fine. You're, you're absolutely fine. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's great. I, I, uh, I often hear, hear um, the god uh, Moloch described as uh, a chicken, but I've heard it talked about as an owl too. Uh, have you come across like ancient gods being described as owls, like Moloch or whatever? Well, depending on the, I mean, the Moloch is a, is a, also a bull, uh-huh. which is another mythic animal. I mean, it's all over the world. It's mythic in ancient Greece and Rome. It's mythic in in the East, and so um, yeah, the owl is all over mythology. But so is a lot of other stuff. I got to be really careful. Like sure. sometimes I'll walk down the street with people, and they're like, "Look, there's an owl lunchbox. Oh, that lady has an owl T-shirt on. There's an owl." calendar in that window and i'm like you know like take a deep breath buddy you know like it's they're all over the place i think it's like like if you want to go with knickknacks trinkets like refrigerator magazines it's cats dogs horses owls like really? that's it that's the that's the order of popularity yeah. of like of like cutesy pie things so i mean if you just so so there's a lot of owl symbolism out there the yeah so what it might mean this is that's what i like to do is i like to pontificate as little as possible though i certainly can be long-winded at times but i love to tell the stories that would imply a like imply so stories that aren't my own so here look, this is one that that i i used to this used to be a one-off i've since gotten a few other examples of exactly this story there's no ufo in this story woman she contacts me she says, begins her letter i am a happy grandmother and she said, when I was a teenager, when I was 16 years old, I was terribly, terribly depressed, terribly depressed. And I was going to kill myself. And I was going to commit suicide. And I got in my car, it was my parents' car, excuse me, got in my parents' car. And I took the hose, a hose and a pillow. I was going to lay the pillow in the back seat. I had a spot all picked out. I was going to lay the pillow in the back seat, lie down with the hose in the car. From the, from the exhaust. So she's driving down this lonely road. She had a little turnout that was all picked out. It's snowing. And she's just about to turn into the turnout. So she's got to slow down. So she slows the car down to turn into the point where she was going to die. And an owl flies right up, <clears throat> owl flies right up to the windshield. She said it was the most mystical thing. It felt like it just hovered there for what seemed like 15 seconds. We locked eyes. Very common. Locked eyes. And it flew off. And I turned around and came home. And things got better. Like, there is there is no way I can read that story in any other way than the owl saved her life. I've got lots of stories. 
about people driving down the road at night. There's a little owl, normal size owl, 10 inch, 12 inch tall owl standing in the road. Whoa, whoa, they got to slow down or they got to kind of drive around it. And then as they proceed forward at a car, room swerves around the next corner. And if, if they would not have stopped for that owl, they would have been in a head on collision. That's very common. So there's like, there's a, you could go down, well, you could cherry pick the data and come up with the creepiest, most nightmarish stories. You could pull old mythology, but, but the modern lore of the owl, which I think represents a human experience that has been with us through the beginning of time. This owl mythology rose for a reason, came up and arose for a reason because people, in my opinion, were having real life, powerful experiences that were connected to highly charged human events. And from that arose the ancient mythology of the owl. Now, our new mythology, our modern mythology, is people seeing a big metal spaceship in the in the in the in their backyard, and then they turn psychic, or they start channeling, or they start a cult. Or I mean, there's all kinds of things that can you know go loopy after the after the event. But I, why is that any different than than the farmer in Ireland that? sees fairies dancing in a circle in their in their wheat field or why is it any different than the than the uh native american who walked off into the prairie and spoke with a talking buffalo or why is that any different than the than the devout catholic who who has an appearance of mary in in their garden right i mean i think all of these things are beyond the what we would call normal reality i think it's just wrapped up in a shinier disguise now than it was you know as opposed to a fairy or a buffalo or a or a bigfoot or these of these other mythologies that are that are just that are just running parallel to us all throughout our human history there we go i i had it muted i started talking and it wasn't coming through uh that's that's yeah i mean that's incredible uh so let me ask you this last thing here and because you just brought it up and just it just it literally just popped in my head um, you brought up Bigfoot, so you did. You did this yourself. Uh, <laughs> I um, I've heard people describe. They they say Bigfoot tries mimicking owls, and I and and I don't know if I, I think most times when people say that they hear the owl that sounds like it's tr- something trying to be like an owl, but it's not, and they're connecting the dot to Bigfoot. Uh, I can tell you that, uh, and this is, this is, um, so, so with my documentaries, um, we're, we're going to be doing a lot of different types of documentaries, but to start out the documentary process, you work with what you got. And, uh, because my show is so, uh, heavily experience based that we started going out to places that people said they had experiences. And we started going in those, those places for a week at a time to see what was what. And, um, I had, and I can't talk too much about it because it's a documentary that hasn't come out yet, but I had a very dramatic experience in the woods last November in an area that was highly talked about when it comes to these cryptid sightings. Um, me and my friend uh, were charged by something in the dark, and it it came up to us. It, 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 like I had to pull my gun out. I thought something was going to blow through me. Uh, it, it's it scared both of us. And up to that point, we were out in the middle of the woods, and all you hear is some bugs. Nothing. You don't hear anything. That happened, and about twenty thirty seconds later, all of a sudden, we hear this loud scream. From behind us, and it sounded like a monkey. And mm-hmm. then uh, I pick up the camera. And then we catch it on camera. This whole thing, but I pick up the camera and we start <laughs> we start walking out. We're like, okay, time to go. Um, and as we're walking out, uh, the base camp heard this interaction. They could hear the yell that happened. They heard the scream that happened, uh, and then they hear hear what's going on in the moment and you hear my friend Joel say that there's monkeys going off around us. Uh, And when I listen back to that recording, it doesn't sound like what I think I remember hearing. 
what I remember hearing is, is, um, is, is monkeys. But on the recording, it sounds like owls. And I don't, I don't quite understand that as to why I heard something in the moment versus what I'm hearing on the recording. Uh, but yeah, we had that experience and you hear people talk about, you know, Bigfoot mimicking owl sounds. I just bring it up because you, you briefly mentioned Bigfoot. Have you had people bring this up to you at all? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Very, I mean, not, not as it's a, it's a lesser pattern, but it's mm-hmm. consistent. So I'm not involved in the Bigfoot research at all. I'm right. open to it, but wow, I got a lot of stories of owls and Bigfoot. Yeah. Wow. And, and uh, mostly it's the, similar to the UFO thing. It's not all at the same time. Now, now, um, and then to be fair, I, I know some researchers, uh, I'll say Joshua Cutchin, Timothy Renner in particular, and a few others. I'll say uh, uh, David Weatherly. Mm-hmm. They all, they, what people are reporting, so owls and, you know, us sometimes there's a pattern, it's minimal, but there's a pattern. People will bring it up. But owls and, excuse me, a Bigfoot and UFO, people will, will often report UFO sightings around the same time, in the same place. So there's this, now that the, the, um, there's a barred owl, which is the largest, excuse me, the loudest North American owl. And they do make a sound like it sounds like chimpanzees in the jungle in a, in a Tarzan movie Mm. that barred owls can make this. And they're loud if you're close to them. And I've been around a lot of owls. Don't, I mean, like I, I hear them every night here, but I'm in a place with a lot of owls that I'm not, that's not too paranormal. But, um, and I lived in a house in upstate New York and wow, did we have some barred owls and wow, were they loud. And the, the call is just sounds just like chimpanzees in the jungle or similar. You can go on Google, you can Google them. There's lots of, there's lots of examples of them. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, it, we're dealing with a, so is Bigfoot a giant ape that we simply haven't categorized zoologically that's living in North America? Like, uh, that's, you know, like maybe, but there's so many paranormal things that are associated. I mean, just the yeah. stories of, of like people following the tracks in the snow and then they get to a big meadow and the tracks just disappear. Like there's all these aspects to the big, I, a lot of, and, and I have, there's a, there's a, there's a researcher named Kiwoni. It's a native American name, but he's, his real name is, he was given this by a tribe, this name, he was anointed with this name. And so he's, and so he, Kiwoni, did a lot of research of people having psychic interaction. Just what I was talking about with the with the aliens, where there's communication, but nobody's lips are moving. People communicating with the Bigfoots telepathically. There's there's a sense of people feeling a profound sense of fear in the presence of of a Bigfoot. These are paranormal events, right? These are so that the owl is connected to a Bigfoot makes total sense when you see it's also connected to to the UFO, as well as these other highly charged human experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, just hearing all the stories with, with these, with the Bigfoot stuff, uh, I, I personally, I feel like there's more to it than just an upright walking, hairy creature mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. We, we just can't keep up with. Uh, and, and I, oh, and I would say that there's something much more going on than little skinny scientists in a flying saucer. That's far too simplistic. The same way that 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 a big hairy ape living in Ohio is far too simplistic. I agree one hundred percent. Well, Mister Mike Cleland, I appreciate you joining me today, and uh, I want to uh, just give you an opportunity to let people know where they can find you. Where what's the best thing to do when they want to reach out to you and things like that. Great. My the easiest way to find me is to Google UFO owls. I'm the first thing that comes up. If you want to. Uh, you can type in my full name, Mike Cleland, all one word, mikecleland.com. And uh, my website comes up. There's It's a homepage that can then take you to Amazon pages and my blog and my podcasts and some illustration work that I've done. One, I want to do, so I got four books. Three of them are nonfiction books on owls. One of them is a fiction book. Just came out last year and I've been really pushing this. Um, it's, people seem to like it. It's getting really wonderful reviews, selling pretty well. It's called The Unseen. And what 
So, so you must have tapped into a little bit, like, as I talk about this stuff, there's like a mood and a vibe of these owl stories. I tried to create a fiction book that, that incorporates that mood and vibe. So that was the, that was the premise of that book. So, um, and, and, and once again, I'm going to say this very clearly. I want to hear your owl stories. Anyone out there, uh, if you've had an owl story, please send them to me. I apologize in advance. I may not be able to get back to you in any meaningful way just because of the flood of them. But please know I do make a very real effort to archive these and, and keep them. Um, like I don't share anyone's name. I don't share the files with anyone, but, uh, but I am looking for overall patterns in the research as far as what it may or may not imply. If you got owl stories, you know where to send them now. Uh, Mike is much more qualified than I am. So, uh, Mike, I appreciate you joining me today for sure. This was great. Thanks so much. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. I don't care where or how you share the show. Just share the show. Any platform you listen on, just take that link, share it around, text it to people. I don't care. Just share the show. That's the best thing you could do to help the show grow. Share the show. And until next Tuesday, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Bye. Yeah. The world that I see is not what you see.